Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Without shouting, you can hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, what about our colleagues online? Is sound uh, working well? Yes, oh, fine, Katarina. Thanks. And the, oh, Kat, could you hear us? Me, me, us? Yes, perfectly. I can't hear you, but that's yes, excellent, good. Okay, we have one as always difficult session after lunch where the distribution of the blood between brain and stomach is not fair, but uh, I can promise you a good session that will uh, make. Um, We'll use artificial intelligence in order to make, uh, to impact the metabolism and to have the more fair distribution of uh, concentration, energy, and hopefully passion for our discussion. Uh, today we will discuss impact of uh, AI on diplomacy and mediation. And uh, we have an excellent lineup. Uh, my colleague, Katarina Hone, who is connecting uh, online and making this uh, session gender diverse thank you uh, thank you kat i don't know if it counts if uh, remote participation in the gender diversity that's it uh, it counts excellent and keep uh, please the whoever is in charge of technology keep kat uh, overlooking us and uh, and uh, that's does the that but kat uh, katarina hone dr katarina hone whom you know people from science diplomacy community is a person behind this session. She conceptualized uh, and brought together a few lines of uh, work at, uh, at Diplo and Geneva Internet Platform dealing with artificial intelligence data and, uh, and other issues. Let me just continue with uh, introducing the remote participants. Uh, we have with us also Dr. Andreas Hibringler, postdoctoral research a fellow, I guess, Center on Conflict Development and Peace Building at the Graduate Institute in, G in Geneva. Uh, uh, Andreas, I, I hope you can hear us. Yes, sort of. I heard something. No? Okay. Kat is, Kat is confirming then that that's, that will work. And in situ, uh, we have, we have um, with us uh, Mr. Samir Shauhan. Uh, I'm always careful in pronouncing it was, it was okay, thank you. I'm the victim of the mispronunciation of my, my last name, therefore I, I have a full empathy with, uh, with, uh, with whoever has a complicated uh, last name and first name, but I managed. Uh, Samir is director of UN International Computing Center uh, one of a uh, person who is bringing uh, technical expertise and knowledge, what is going on under the bonnet when we did, when we got excited discussing AI and ethics and you know this this grand issues, he comes and he says, okay, let let me tell you what is going on in reality. Therefore, we're really honored to have uh, to have with us uh, uh, Samir to to provide inputs on AI, but also what ICC is doing here. And uh, we are particularly honored that uh, the Samir is accompanied by Marco Liuzzi. Is it? Uh... Correct, perfect. Oh my God, oh, I'm good at getting right, in spite of the after lunch session. Uh, Marco is the Chief Operations Division of uh, at the UN International Computing Center. Uh, also impressive um, uh, bio and background in technology working in Brindisi. Uh, by the way, for those of you who do, do not know, uh, International Computing Center has a big center in Brindisi in Italy, which, which operates quite a few servers and, uh, and uh, other tools. And next to me is another Jovan. Uh, his name is Jovan Jegic. Jovan is the head of AI and Data Lab, uh, uh, which is hosted in Belgrade, uh, Diplo's uh, AI and Data Lab. Therefore, when you see all of these applications that uh, we have been uh, running, uh, this is basically done by Jovan and his team. And we'll, see, we'll be seeing uh, later on Anya, young uh, doctoral student who is, uh, who is also developing applications uh, on AI and data. Okay, this is the lineup. We have everything ready for really good discussion. And we should answer three questions. And hopefully nobody will, will uh, fell asleep during our uh, the risky sessions afternoon. Boris, I'm watching uh, carefully. Uh, you're, you're okay, you're, you're in the first row. Boris is a good friend of Diplo and GAP, philosopher, thinker of Geneva scene, uh, and, uh, and a person who reflects on many issues which are going in Geneva. And uh, you can learn probably from Boris 
I would say he's a, you, you are among the top five people who understand cross-linking nature of international Geneva. You may leave us for the session on the green. In the... Only one in your opinion, but I feel very flattered. Thank you. <laughs> no, you don't dare to sleep. <laughs> okay. We have a few questions to discuss today. The first question is, which tools have been developed and demonstrated as a pilot project and how they impact the work of diplomats and mediators? What works in practice? What are the concrete tools that we can, can use? This is the first question. Second question. How can conversation between diplomatic practitioners and the developers of AI application be facilitated for creating needs-oriented tools? I'm sure that we'll be hearing a lot from ICC experience because you are often on this borderline between, between diplomatic and technical uh, uh, professions. And the third question, why is it important to have this conversation now? Because we are here. And what are the, some of the current and potential future challenges? Sort of, sort of uh, uh, questions is let's see what what exists now. What is the problem in communication between different communities, and what is ahead of us? There are a few principles. One principle is that uh, the only stupid question is the question which is not asked. There are a few more, but uh, therefore, please ask the question, challenge our thinking, bring experience uh, uh, inputs from your experience. We have a lot of expertise here in the room. Therefore, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, and we will uh, we'll, uh, consider it with priority. Also, with the remote participation, CAT will help us on, on, on that. Now, we decided to do, to, to make this session a bit more interesting uh, in, uh, in, uh, by trying to walk the talk. We'll speak about Discuss AI, but today, uh, Diplos AI Lab uh, uh, and Jovan organized it. He will tell us in a few lines what we'll be doing. We'll use AI in order to report from this session. Therefore, we will transcribe the half, first half of the session. We cannot do it whole session because for creating knowledge graph, you need a bit of time. You cannot do it in real time. At least Diplo doesn't have that powerful computers. Uh, and then we will present at the end of the session uh, results of this AI analysis, in, including how would uh, how would machine map the the, the project. The idea is to see what is the knowledge pattern developed by six of us during discussion, how this knowledge pattern relates to other knowledge at Wikipedia, at uh, Diplo. And uh, Jovan, what, what else uh, can you tell us in this introduction, how it will work? Uh, <laughs> well, basically, uh, we will use AI algorithms in order to first to transcribe uh, audio from the session to the, to the text, then we will analyze uh, the text by extracting uh, names, entities mentioned in the discussion, and then we will try to extract relations between those uh, entities mentioned. And uh, then we will go to uh, some open source knowledge uh, uh, graphs and the knowledge bases, uh, which are publicly available online, such as Wikipedia, Bubblenet, uh, DBpedia, etc., and try to link those knowledges to to uh, that knowledge graphs and to extract some information which could be useful. And finally, that mini knowledge graph we created uh, from this session, we will try to embed to, into the uh, deep knowledge graph, which consists of all uh, blogs, updates, posts, books from the deep organization, people, uh, geographical uh, uh, countries and and uh, stuff like that so we will try to see how it links to the to the topics and subtopics which uh, uh, are uh, available present in the knowledge graph uh, thank you thank you Johan. It's the same name and we have to find some other way not to confuse the audience uh, we what we are going to the concept behind this broader concept is that we can have artificial intelligence on small and targeted data we don't need to wait for Facebook and Google to, uh, to collect big data. Uh, and uh, this is the first point. Therefore, this is conceptual challenge. Can we regain data and in particular patterns that describe our lives? Because everybody is focusing today on data, protection of data, but the major battle ahead of, the, ahead of us is a battle about the patterns. Patterns in culture, patterns in arts, patterns in our day-to-day -day behavior. Therefore, today, six of us will create some pattern. 
Should it be owned by six of us? Should it be owned by JESDA and Diplo and ICC or global, in our case, it's a global commons. But the key idea is to challenge the idea that, that somebody who collects a lot of data can uh, also own the patterns of our behavior. Mind you, six or seven years ago, we used to have 10 years ago, the photos you just download from the net. Nowadays, if you want to download the photo to include, you have a shutter, you have those, uh, those stacks, and uh, you have the privatization of the huge part of the photo uh, heritage uh, of, uh, of mankind. One day, in the most radical form, we may have the patterns from Cervantes or from the Aristotle or Plato owned by some companies, which personally for me is a difficult, uh, difficult notion. Therefore, the major battle ahead of us on AI is battle for patterns, patterns of cognition, relation, and other things. Today, we'll, through knowledge graph, as Jovan Jagic explained, we'll try to see what type of patterns we are creating during this discussion and ultimately what we can do with these patterns. Uh, it is global commons, but that's just the challenge, conceptual challenge with enormous governance and I would say even philosophical impacts. Now, uh, Kat, uh, Andreas and us, let's be careful what we are talking uh, because now everything will be codified into knowledge graphs. We have to be, we have the name, obviously. Uh, uh, joking, I don't know if uh, AI can recognize humor. Uh, I don't think so. Oh my <laughs> God, that's, that's good news. <laughs> we have some refuge still for where we can hide from the machines. Uh, Kat, uh, the question for you, uh, based on your research, what are the ways in which AI can serve as a tool for diplomacy and mediation? And can you uh, sort of introduce to us uh, broad uh, mapping and overview what's going on and how, how we should uh, go ahead? Uh, thank you, Jovan. Um, great to be here, even though it's uh, it's remotely. Um, but I'm really happy we make this uh, session hybrid, because we have 64 people here in the room online with us. So adding to the uh, local audience. Uh, the usual question first: Can you hear me okay? You can hear me well. Kat, we can hear you. I, I find uh, made an in inappropriate joke, which Boris will tolerate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. So, um, I, I really would like to use your question, Yuan, to, to provide a, a broad introduction for our discussion and, and a little bit of, of, a, of a mapping. So, I mean, the first thing we need to keep in mind is when we talk about AI, we're talking about a lot of different applications, a lot of different uh, totally different technologies, basically. As we are talking about machine learning and then different applications of machine learning, such as image recognition, natural language processing, but also pattern recognition that then feeds into um, decision making. And when we look at diplomacy and conflict resolution and mediation, um, a couple of examples come to mind. What is important to keep in mind is that all of these examples are at the exploratory phase. As far as I know, there are pilot projects that are really interesting to look at. So when we talk about, for example, image recognition, one thing that comes to mind is the analysis of satellite images. So we're talking about looking at borders or the development of refugee camps, movement of troops on the ground, or even looking at natural resources and how they're used and how they're developing. When we talk about natural language processing, there are many examples, and my colleague Jovan Njegic will go a little bit deeper into this, but basically what we're talking about is, for example, um, speech writing, uh, help with diplomatic reporting, um, analyzing speeches, analyzing conference contributions, and we will do this live in CETA today. We're, look, we're also talking about things like looking at social media content, um, but also preparing for negotiations by analyzing previous uh, negotiations and previous contracts. One of the examples I like to use in these contexts comes from the area of trade negotiations. And there, for example, it is said that the average trade uh, deal, the average trade agreement between two countries in the 1950s was about 5,000 words long. Today, it's 50,000 words long. So having a kind of way to automate this process or augment the human capability to analyze these treaties and be prepared for negotiations is becoming actually a necessity to, um, to some degree. So when you ask me about diplomacy and mediation and how AI can come into this field, 
there are basically five broad areas I think that stand out. We are talking essentially first about knowledge management and background research. Second, about generating a good understanding of the negotiation of the conflict and of the parties involved. Third, we're also talking about creating a greater inclusivity of the process and um, a broader understanding of the situation, bringing in different voices, voices that would perhaps normally not be at the negotiation table. Fourth, we're talking about support in drafting texts or analyzing large amounts of text. And then fifth, and I think this is really important when we talk about diplomacy, in particular um, peace negotiations, implementation, follow-up, and um, compliance. So having, having kind of provided this broad overview, I have two more philosophical points, if I may. And the first one relates to the fact that we really have to keep in mind that we are essentially building these tools, that we have the agency to create these tools and to build them according to, um, to needs. So my, uh, my emphasis here would be that whenever we talk about AI for diplomacy and mediation, I think the starting point has to be uh, the practitioners and the needs of the specific negotiation and uh, the need of practitioners, what they are needing, what is supporting them. So we should not start from the technology, but we should start from what need are we trying to, um, to address here. And there, there's a quote I would like to bring into this conversation, which comes from a historian of technology. His name is Melvin Kranzberg. And the quote is the following, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And for me, this kind of exemplifies the challenge we have ahead, which is obviously we can use artificial intelligence for good. We can use it for bad. But what we also have to keep in mind, it's not neutral. We are designing it. We are creating the rules um, of engagement. We are taking decisions at all steps of the development of an artificial intelligence application. And my last point is a point on trust. Trust is so fundamental in diplomacy, in peacemaking, and uh, in mediation. And to think through how trust is shifting or what it means uh, for trust in diplomacy and negotiation when we introduce these kind of tools, what it means for mediators, what it means for diplomats. That is a, a host of really interesting questions that perhaps we can get back to in, in the discussion. But let me stop here and give the floor back to you, Jovan. Thank you. Thank you, Kat, for this great, great overview and a few reminders uh, that should uh, be the guardrails for our discussion in order to, uh, to avoid any sort of hype driven uh, or marketing, uh, which fortunately our panelists are here excellent and we won't have another spiel that these days you can hear about AI and uh, related uh, related tools. Uh, we, uh, with this, uh, the stage is set for discussion. We are moving to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, Andreas. Andreas, uh, you have been focusing on AI for mediation. Geneva is one of the hub of mediation. We have um, um, with us colleague Enrico from the UN who has been doing a lot on, on mediation. And uh, what are some of the opportunities and some of the pitfalls when it comes to use of AI of, of mediation, which I guess from your research and Kat's research is, is probably together with the humor, ultimate frontier of the use of AI in diplomacy because mediations are intrinsically uh, interpersonal developments when you need the trust, you know, the chemistry, especially in some conflict zones uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, uh, Andreas, over to you. If you are with us, we haven't heard from you. Yeah, uh, Johan, I think the technology is slightly betraying us in this regard because we don't have him in the room with us at the moment. So we're trying to get him back, but uh, let's see what's okay. Happening. Kat, try to mediate the solution. In, in the meantime, we are moving to, to, uh, to, to Samir. Uh, Samir, you are um, uh, at this, uh, your organization that you lead is on the, this border zone between diplomacy and technology. And you try to reduce uh, lost in transla uh, the translation when it comes to concept, but also you have to deliver concrete applications. Organizations are asking, asking you to do it. What would be your reflection on that, uh, negotiating this border zone uh, dynamics between policymakers, diplomats, and technical people? And in, in also, what are the concrete applications that you have been developing? Sure thing. Thank you, John. Uh, pleasure to be here. 
<clears throat> so just a bit of background, ICC uh, or UNICC, we are based in Geneva uh, and we support the entire UN system with technology. So uh, starting from a history 51 years ago, now we are involved in, in this nitty gritty of where is technology leading us and what role does the UN have to play in, in this space? So as we support the entire UN system, we are involved in many, many different uh, solutions that need to be deployed and utilized for sensitive negotiations. So I'll give you some examples and where AI has been put to good use in my opinion. So uh, a great example starts with uh, the climate change COP where we were involved last year. And uh, given that till the last moment, they did not know whether it would be a hybrid conference on uh, physical or completely virtual, uh, they had 50,000 plus participants. How do you register them? And how do you authorize them to have the right permission so they can participate? Because you don't want to have a situation where a certain parts of the world could not uh, communicate, could not participate, and they felt left out. <clears throat> so we had to come up with uh, an AI-based uh, biometrics solution to register all the delegates worldwide. Uh, and in a way that the AI bias was known, and in a very short period of time, we had to minimize that bias so that we did not have certain parts of the world where delegates could not be registered or were not recognized when it was their turn to speak. So some really complicated, naughty challenges that we encountered for the first time. Uh, we were fairly successful. We ended up with 70% of the delegates who managed to register online using the AI tools. The remaining 30% had to uh, call into a service desk that we had set up a 24 seven service desk where a, an individual, you still need those individuals to sit there and verify and confirm the delegate was who, or she, who he or she said they were and authorize them with the right permissions. Uh, so that was one example where we saw it in practice. And since we finished it and spoke about it, there's many, many use cases coming up across the UN system where they are looking for something like that. Uh, and even post pandemic, because there's a interesting conversation happening across the UN ecosystem uh, where they want to bring the greater world into those conversations. So back to some of the points Katharina raised, how do you bring in the voices that are not at the table into the conversation? So uh, some of the senior management in the UN is very aware of it that unless we can bring the common population in, we have the tools, we have the technology, if they are not welcome to participate, the UN becomes more and more of an ivory tower where governments meet, they discuss, but then the common public has very little to do with it. But how do you bring them in? Uh, you need technology and you need some of these tools to acknowledge and to know the person is who they say they are. For example, when they're uh, participating, when they contribute. So, so there are many, many kind of applications that come with it. The other thing we uh, saw a great use case for is uh, analyzing all the documents. So the UN, large parts of the UN generate documents. And to Katharina's point, there used to be uh, trade documents used to be 50,000 words down to 500,000 words, right? Or whatever, the numbers are 5,000 and 50,000. How do you go back and analyze all the documents, whether they're related to trade, whether they're related to human rights, go back and say, what was each country's stance? What was their position? What did they say in the past? What are they saying today? Uh, to have to go through using even traditional tech, knowledge management tools, tools it's not possible anymore given the volume of data that exists historically and the volumes of data that's been produced now, which is exponential. Uh, so we are trying to apply AI in those use cases. And that's where you find some very interesting uh, situations where there's a lot of marketing. So when you look at the commercial companies and I won't name names, uh, uh, they offer AI cutting edge, oh, it'll do this, it'll do that. We start to put them uh, uh, to, to test against these solutions. And you know what, it doesn't work because unfortunately a lot of the tech is built by a certain kinds of individuals, mostly white male, a certain age, uh, by certain geographies, <clears throat> and that handles certain languages. And in the UN context, when you're asking them to analyze documents that were written in different languages uh, with different uh, implications, connotations of what was said and, and the UN speak that was used, this AI falls down. So you have to spend massive amounts of money retraining it, what has been sold to you, before you can actually make it practical and applicable and start to analyze these volumes of documents, there's a lot of effort that has to be put in. And that's when we began to realize it's our IP. It's the collective UN systems IP that is training this AI. And we say, hey, it's great because we're training the AI, AI is good for us, but that IP goes back to a commercial organization. And back to the point you were raising, Jovan, earlier, that's a big challenge because over time, 
it's the commercial AIs that are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. And we see that within a year, what was free becomes expensive and then it becomes more expensive, right? The smarter the AI becomes, the more expensive it becomes for us to use, which is why open source uh, non-commercial models are so critical in my opinion, because long-term uh, it'll be large corporates who will have the entire world uh, yeah, uh, at their beck and call, so to speak. So documents was another area where we think there's applications. We are, we are starting to see some traction, but we're realizing it's a much more complicated uphill battle than you would imagine, even with the cutting edge tech that's sold to you. Uh, the third area we see, and I'll stop at three for now, is uh, real-time insights. So when you have big meetings, uh, and again, climate change was one, but there's several others, human rights conferences, it's important to analyze the common public sentiment. So you start to do sentiment analysis, not just of the delegates and who's tweeting what or saying what, but what's the average Joe, if you will, uh, pardon my gender bias, is, is saying about this, yeah? And, and that gets very interesting, but it gives you very meaningful insights to say, are these going the way we think they're going? What's the average public thinking about these negotiations that are happening right now? And uh, that again, uh, there's, there's a real value in that, I think, and you need to harness AI. It's impossible to do it given the volumes of data that's flying at you real time. Uh, the challenge becomes you have to use commercial tech. So to do a tw Twitter sentiment analysis, for example, uh, at certain volumes, you have to start paying Twitter to say, I want to eat all this data and consume it and analyze it. So even though all of us might be tweeting and saying, hey, it's free, I'm tweeting. I don't have to pay anything. At the other end, somebody's paying for it. Uh, so, so there are some real interesting challenges that pop up as we start to uh, look at how AI is used. So I, I think there are many, many use cases where it will be extremely important to use AI effectively. It will help us do our job uh, by listening to a much larger population than we listen to today. Uh, but we'll have to keep that commercial aspect in mind. I'll thank, stop there. Thank, thank you, you Samir, for, for, for the really great, great insights. Uh, <laughs> There is one aspect where, which is usually not known, but I always mention to Google representatives. The first Google translation software was developed uh, based on the UN documents. And I said, you had this initial investment. Somebody was translating this UN document. They basically siphoned the document. You have declaration in the English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, and they basically started developing. Obviously, they are now uh, much, much more ahead. But there is a real question uh, how we do serious public-private partnerships. And the key is to understand what's going on. We should not go into the, into the let's say, um, sleepwalk by the latest hype, as you indicated. We should uh, partner with the companies. This is very important. They are creative providers of solutions with, with, with clarity what is a, a private and public interest. What's happened in Bangalore a few years ago, Google created, uh, uh, asked by Bangalore authorities to create, I think, mapping of public transport. Uh, they use data and then Bangalore wanted to build, I think, stadium and they went back to Google and say, could you give us a simulation of traffic for our new stadium? And Google told them, okay, but you have to pay for it. And they said, but we paid you and it's our data. I said, no, it's uh, now our patterns. That what we are speaking about very serious, I would say, on the social contract uh, level. And it's great to have you uh, both at your position and in the town to make a reminder that this public-private partnership should be made in a full responsibility, clarity, and with the understanding of people like you who are, uh, who are here at the training uh, exercise, what is in it in short term, in medium term, in long term. Otherwise, we can walk just into the sleep, walk into the Folk. This is the add-on to the sleepwalk. Great, uh, as a lot of questions. I, I'm sure that it can uh, can uh, uh, continue with the points. I hope we are inspiring some comments and questions, especially critical ones, in the from the audience. But we just move uh, move. Uh, um, uh, we are still with the UNICC. And Marco, uh, you what was in the plan? Um, uh, what are the challenges and what is ahead of us? when it comes to AI and these dilemmas it's indicated. Thank you. Thank you, Jovan, first for, for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure. And I hope you can all hear me. Well, yes. Uh, yes? Yes. 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 No, okay. no, Boris is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
Challenges is a good question, of course, and uh, I go back to, to the quote by Catherine earlier that technology is not uh, good or bad. Um, challenges also come with, uh, with opportunities. With new technology, there are always challenges, and uh, from the challenges of uh, any new technology that is not mature, uh, all the way to the, to the specific challenges of AI. Uh, I won't go to the to ultimate challenge. Some authors talk about AI becoming God, and uh, but you know that's we'll leave that aside for the time being. But uh, there is one that it's uh, particular. It's uh, it was alluded to as well, which is uh, the issue of, of bias in uh, in AI. So that is a challenge. And why is it a challenge? We were uh, at a conference, uh, uh, a presentation, discussion with the uh, UN uh, uh, consortium, let's say, of UN staff associations. And when the topic came of technology, uh, you know, we discussed AI, there was a clear uh, knowledge of the risks, a clear concern you know, that those uh, um, type of algorithms would be used and, uh, you know, and uh, how, what is done to avoid uh, that, uh, that bias actually becomes embedded into the algorithm. So that, that is a challenge and it's a dual challenge. It's the challenge of, uh, uh, in a way, perception, which is good and bad. It's good because it challenges the practitioner of technology to make sure it's, uh, it stands up to scrutiny. So it must be there. Uh, it, should avoid, it should not be as much, you know, uh, too much in a sense that it, it, will, it, it prevents the technologies to move forward in the right ways. Yeah? So it, there is a balance there. So there is a risk in both ways. Um, so it's good and let's keep the good side. Um, there is an opportunity there. I'm not sure uh, if, at, at least that's, that's the way I see it. Um, many AI algorithms, and that's the difference from AI from previous algorithms, so previous uh, ways of, uh, you know, previous solutions, is that AI learns. And that makes it qualitatively different than the challenges of previous solutions, where actually the knowledge was provided by humans. There was a clear responsibility of humans providing that knowledge and telling the the, the uh, algorithms what to do. So it was easy to pinpoint the developer of the algorithm. It's not so clear cut now because of the learning element. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, bias is defined among humans as a prejudice, uh, unfairness. In, uh, in science, uh, it's a systematic error. So if uh, uh, we remove when the, this AI learns, I mean, I won't go into the history of many instances of bias, I and mean, there's been, I'll mention one, one maybe, which is the 2018, there was a algorithm by Amazon to hire, uh, which was found it was sexist, to hire more men than women. And uh, the thing is that the learning happened on the existing data, existing, so past, uh, you know, hires. So it, reflecting that the fact that past hires were, were biased. So they canceled the algorithm. And I want to make one point that all of the engineers did not want to be associated with that algorithm. They don't want, because they felt it was bad, the outcome, and they didn't want to be uh, accountable in a sense. The outcome was part of the learning, not their job, you know, what they did there. Um, but canceling the algorithm didn't it, uh, that, I, I don't know the history in Amazon later, but uh, they, they went back to the previous practices. And if they did, wouldn't be the bias still be there? So what I'm, what I'm trying to say in a sense, and that's the opportunity I see, is that what is uh, something human, and it's very hard to tell a human uh, HR person you are biased, because in this particular hiring process, uh, you, know, you, you actually hired the man, not the woman. You hired the, you know, the, the, the English man and not the, the, you know, some, some other country. It's very hard and it's a difficult conversation to have. When it comes to the algorithm, it's a, it's a science. It's a systematic error that needs to be corrected. So in that sense, it may not be, you know, it may not be work, uh, a workable solution or cases. In some cases, at least uh, you, you are turning a human problem, very difficult to solve. And, and some people say that the solution of prejudice uh, or right faces means the fact to recognize that you are actually biased. Yeah, so it's a very difficult uh, thing to, to handle at the human level. But if we make it a scientific problem, a technology problem, maybe we'll have an opportunity to help solve it in certain application. You shouldn't, AI shouldn't be replacing all the human processes, but in some we'll turn something, a problem that exists today of bias into a technological problem that needs to be solved. Yeah, so that is, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking about challenges and opportunities. 
So to a degree, this can be a solution for all, but to a degree, we can we can embrace this and make sure that we, we actually you know we actually treat it uh, you know properly uh, with, with care. Um, what's coming next? Uh, um, What's coming next is uh, we, as, as UNICC, we actually hear our customers. And uh, uh, in the sense that we, the solution is needs-based solution. So we, we don't uh, come with prototype or research new technology. And I think it's useful if, in, in the context of AI, uh, which means it's uh, um, some time and the real, uh, the real breakthroughs are incremental at this point in time. There are these uh, qualitatively new, new technology, particularly around learning, machine learning, et cetera, that we can always refine and make it practical uh, for, the, uh, for the needs of the UN system and all diplomacy. One element that is key, apart from what I mentioned, is uh, diplomacy, uh, some elements of uh, uh, the support that needs to be done to, to, you know, to diplomacy is high risk, meaning if the wrong information is provided, uh, it's... Uh, uh, the, the consequences could be could be uh, really bad. So it's interesting to work, and, and at one point, uh, uh, probably needs to be looked at more widely. Today, there is a EU, EU proposal about uh, managing having a risk-based approach to AI. Yeah. So this will be, I think, particularly important when it comes to AI applied to specific fields where there is a high impact. And again, diplomacy in certain cases can certainly be one. Wars can start because of uh, you know, mistakes done. Uh, in, in, uh, in knowledge provided by this output. Thank, thank you, thank you, Marco, for a, a great overview and concrete examples. While two of you were speaking, I was thinking about two empty chairs, <laughs> and uh, I was who would sit in these two empty chairs? And one is definitely AI. That we would ask AI what they would tell us about uh, about, and the other well, the other empty chair is uh, basically future generations. We don't have in the in the, our rooms, and we discuss climate change, AI, data. We don't have interests of future generations. We are a bit of chronocentric or narcissistic. We think that everything is uh, happening now, but things that have been happening in the past, and it, inshallah, it will continue happening in the future. And we are we going to pass to the next generation uh, uh, cultural heritage that we got from previous generations, from literature, books. Architecture, architecture is questionable that we'll have pyramids for the next generation. But it's a good question to have in the old rooms uh, at least two chairs or at least one chair, chair for AI and chair for the future generation. This may be proposal from the Science Week that we ask UN to put uh, start putting the chairs to remind us that there are other people in the room in, in addition to to, to us. And uh, that was a great, great survey. I feel like uh, moving out of the panel and uh, letting the three of you discuss because Jo and Yegic often ask this question about, about bias. And when we have a great application and I say, wow, what a lovely tool. And he said, but there is a bias here. I said, don't spoil the party. Mm -hmm. Let's have the application. And uh, that's always an interesting discussion. Uh, Kat, how is the negotiation with uh, Andres? Uh, we negotiated, but uh, I think the technology is still not still not with us, so we don't have Andreas yet. Okay, that's then we will will hear uh, hear later on uh, from him. Johan, there's just an update, and Andreas is here actually. Where in the room, oh. physical? He's <laughs> he's with us virtually. Uh, virtually, uh, okay, okay. So I think we can bring him into the conversation. Okay. Andreas, uh, I don't know if you if you heard the question. The question is about your research and experience on AI and mediation. It's Thank great so to much. have you with us. And, uh, my sincere apologies for for coming late. I'm uh, working from from home in Oslo, and I did just was just on the way back home. I had an incident on the road, um, and no phone number to get in touch with. Uh, but I hope I do have a bit of time left to uh, to share some of my views. Yeah, yeah, please, please uh, go ahead. Did you drive Tesla on AI or? I actually have, uh, I actually have, uh, I, I was driving an uh, AI supported car for sure, but that was not the problem. Uh, it's public holiday okay. here in Oslo today and uh, it's uh, a bit crazy uh, on the street. So it's all human factors uh, that were, that were responsible. Oh, these humans are always uh, complicating matters. Right. <laughs> go ahead, please, please go ahead, Andres. 
Good. So obviously, I didn't I didn't join the uh, conversation before, but uh, if you would like uh, me to speak a little bit about uh, how we're looking at AI in in peace mediation, and I'd be very happy to do to do that. So I uh, thank you so much for the invitation and for for making time at uh, this uh, late uh, moment uh, to still uh, to still uh, um, bring me into the conversation. Um, so we we did a little bit of research uh, over the past years at the at the Granite Institute at the CCDP in Geneva in collaboration with with uh, with partners from a Technical University in Germany in, in, in Karlsruhe at the KIT, and and we've been mainly working on uh, efforts to understand how and if we could use AI for for tax mining applications in support of peace mediation. Um, and I'd like to just share maybe a few uh, points and insights about um, uh, about about this research process. So I think I'd like to start with just a bit talking about how, in in my view, having talked to quite a few uh, mediation professionals and 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 and, and, and mediators, uh, people look at AI uh, currently, and I think it's quite important to kind of demystify it. And you've probably done this over the past. 45 minutes uh, uh, already, but uh, so please uh, um, interrupt me if I, if I repeat myself. But um, so in in peace mediation, I think there is you know it's a it's a very human centered field, probably quite uh, like uh, diplomacy, and and very often uh, mediators tend to still look at it more as an art uh, than a science, something that really requires people bringing people together in a room and having as as little technology as possible, and then. On the other hand, uh, obviously, uh, particularly over the past few years, also because of uh, initiatives out of Geneva, I think this this view has changed, and there is this question of what AI can really uh, really do uh, for uh, for uh, peace mediation. Um, but I think there is a tendency to have a kind of very techno centered view, and to also um, think of AI as you know producing peace agreements just as we can forecast the weather uh, in, in that sense or you know write, writing peace agreements like we write, like AI might be able to write novels uh, today it seems that this is something that is increasingly capable of doing um, so uh, but this obviously this kind of technocentric view is also quite problematic and I just want to say a few things of why I think when we're looking at peace and mediation in the future we need to look at something that I would call kind of hybrid peacemaking intelligence. And that's very much kind of the integration between uh, human intelligence and, 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 and artificial intelligence in, in, in rather kind of closely knit circles of, of knowledge production. And I, and I think the key reason for this is something, and maybe you've talked about this before, um, um, is, is, is something called context, or that I would call context autonomy. Uh, obviously, uh, not only AI, but also humans need to know the context well in, in which they operate. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not a machine learning expert, from, but from what I've understood is that uh, at least um, the, 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 the AIs used uh, in, for, in, for instance, for, for text mining need to know the context well in which they apply. It. So conventional ML needs to have, you know, training data, right? Uh, obviously, you have other net, uh, other other um, other um, AI approaches as well, including neural networks that can operate uh, with uh, with 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 larger unstructured and uncoded uh, data sets. But at least you have, need to have something like a ground truth or something that informs your model, something that you can be you can be looking for. And everyone who's been working in in peace mediation knows peace process as well is that they do not follow. A guidebook, and at least from, from from what I've gathered, I think there is, is is a clear indication, therefore, that the AI that can be applied in 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 support of peace mediation will therefore be rather narrow, because if it's rather narrow, then it can handle the context better and it can operate autonomously. But this autonom autonomy will be very much kind of quite closely bounded by 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 the kind of the humans with which they. It, it works in, in kind of in, in kind of a human of a loop approach. Um, I'd like to just quickly flag two examples and hand back to you and see where where we want to pick up the conversation. So um, I've already mentioned that uh, here uh, at the CCDP we are we have experimented with argument mining um, and we will hopefully do so uh, in in the future again analyzing basically um, uh, either you know, um, uh, for instance, text from 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 peace negotiations, or also from from media or social media to really understand um, how 
uh, how conflict party positions shape up, what interests are there, maybe what narratives exists around conflict. Um, there is a, a small team, I've seen a, an interesting paper, a small team out of Oxford and Warwick that have, uh, for instance, used um, transcripts from uh, peace negotiations um, to, um, to, uh, to, to model uh, conflict party positions and distances between conflict uh, party positions using uh, the buried language processing uh, tool. And I'm not an expert on those tools, but I'm very happy to share, to share uh, that particular paper. And I just wanna uh, flag that I think these, these, these applications are promising, but there's you know, all sorts of challenges coming in here. First of all, many peace negotiations are, are not recorded. A lot of parts of the negotiations do happen, you know, off off record, uh, off site. Um, uh, maybe parties will not actually uh, convey their their true positions in in a negotiation process. So, in terms of you know, you can I think worthwhile modeling arguments and opinions, but then in terms of you know assessing the value of that information that can be that can be analyzed. I think this is where 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 where, where human mediators are very much asked to to kind of interpret uh, that information. Um, and a, a second example that I think is quite uh, interesting is, is uh, um, experiments by the UN Innovation Cell in, in New York together with the, with the Middle Eastern uh, um, uh, offices there. Uh, also, I think working on, on the Yemen context, but also I think recently on, in Iraq. Uh, and they are, they're using AI for, they call it kind of large scale online focus groups where, where, where text mining tools and NLP are integrated to enable kind of a, a dialogue between one mediator and the larger group of, of participants, maybe hundreds. And, and, and there are models that help to kind of cluster the responses of, of the participants. And then there is something like a voting exercise that also helps to, to understand what of the responses, what of the opinions or or interests that are in the answers uh, are, are more widespread and more accepted uh, among the group. And I think this is a very interesting example because you know it's quite narrow. It's closely integrated uh, with, the with the mediation team. And um, there is uh, also kind of a combination of, of, kind of qualitative text mining and then some, some statistical uh, quantitative uh, calculation to understand uh, you know, what, what, the, what the group uh, or what the population wants and needs. But I'll, I'll stop here and I'll, I hope I'll, I'll be part of the conversation for, for the rest. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Andreas. It's great to have you back. Well, a uh, few messages from uh, uh, underlying messages. Avoid hype. Context is the king or queen, whatever we uh, choose to, to, uh, to use. And uh, be realistic when it comes to the impact of AI and use it in some sort of hybrid smart, uh, smart scenario. We are halfway through, through our session. Now we will have a Jovan Jegic presentation of practical tools from, uh, from his experience. Uh, for uh, your team in, uh, in, in, in Belgrade, uh, Anya and others, you can stop uh, now here transcribing and work on the knowledge, knowledge graph. And the cut, uh, I can see that it's very busy in the chat session. Therefore, after Jovan Jegic, you can come with a summary of questions for the, from the online chat to make a quality of participation in these hybrid meetings. And then we will pass the floor to you for questions and to our, our panel for answers. Uh, therefore, we start with, uh, with, uh, with Jovan. I don't know, Jovan, uh, I, I, I can tell you what, what, what is a typical situation. I prepare a presentation and I ask, Jovan, I have to explain to diplomats AI and said, can we do it with the flags? And then he created a flag recognition pattern software in Belgrade and other tools that uh, he has been he has been using. I don't know if he can share the screen, maybe from uh, from uh, from Belgrade team that you can see this application. Then they are public good; you can access them. They are accessible online. Jovan, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, it seems that we are gonna. Oh, you're so efficient. Screen. Yes, this is uh, the uh, We have uh, various applications. Uh, some of them are using AI, some of them are just data visualization applications, but uh, they're all, we believe they're all fun and, and maybe useful. Uh, so this is application which uh, detects the amounts of colors in the flags. Uh, uh, we hope to improve it later to try to detect shapes and uh, 
at this point, you just uh, can detect colors and you can sort all the flags according to the, the percentage of certain color in the flag. Maybe, Johan, on this point, what was interesting, uh, as you know, there are the uh, Latin American flags have the blue and white, uh, typically Slavic blue, white and red. The Arab have their own patterns, uh, African flags. And it was interesting to see the sort of families of the of the flags or or Scandinavian uh, flags and the uh, exactly it's it's uh, funny how you can uh, from the uh, percentage of the color of the flag you can uh, even sort and see uh, origins of of uh, uh, different nations. So uh, uh, the second application is uh, we can show uh, speech generator or maybe uh, countries companies. Countries companies is also a fun one. Uh, you can choose any country and see which uh, tech company is similar to that country's GDP. Uh, we compare revenue of the company with uh, uh, and try to find the uh, similar similar GDP of the country. Or you can even uh, choose to compare historical values of GDP uh, with historical values of of uh, companies' revenues and see how they change from, from, uh, through the history. Uh, speech generator is uh, the app uh, which aims to help uh, uh, diplomats writing speeches. You can uh, select various topics and then uh, go to the generate speech and by uh, uh, using uh, those uh, sliders on the side, you can uh, choose a sentiment of your of your uh, addressing and uh, uh, get different different um, texts, but uh, we have to say uh, there are also a lot of experts work uh, on these texts, so it's not uh, fully AI generated. Maybe just Johan here. There was one uh, international law. How does international existing applies to cyberspace? Some countries say a, a modified way or direct way, and this is a big issue when you go to the UNGG negotiation on the open-ended working group. Now, I won't go into acronyms, but people spend weeks or months discussing how it applies to international law. Therefore, what you want to say, uh, the uh, experts plus the system codify that and put, and uh, you can see, and later on, there was also, if you want to be closer to certain country, you can, you yes, can. Yes, you, you can compare to them. But uh, that's the main point. Uh, uh, in in uh, DIPO, we are trying to deal with augmented intelligence. So we try to augment experts' intelligence with AI. We don't uh, want to to compete uh, artificial intelligence and and artificial uh, and uh, expert intelligence, but to combine them. Maybe we should change the name of the world to the augmented intelligence world. <laughs> we can do that. But it's uh, uh, it's uh, very important because uh, when you try to uh, put uh, um, AI into the work uh, on the organizational level, you start to uh, deal with a bunch of practical problems which try to, uh, which later unwind into really philosophical problems uh, from uh, what kind of documents you're using, what is the domain of the organization. For example, it is much harder to use some AI tool to, uh, uh, to detect sentiment on the diplomatic speech uh, than detecting sentiment on the review of some product. It's it's really com di completely different thing. And uh, how do you deal with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the main thing you want to do with AI is first to retrieve uh, precise and correct information from the bunch of uh, data which are splattered in all other uh, different uh, various uh, types of documents. Uh, Maybe you can go to sandbox as a data sandbox as a tool mm -hmm. for the uh, for the normalization. If still Anya is sharing this with us, mm -hmm. uh, second please. Okay, mm -hmm. Anya, uh, that's that's an interesting tool. We we have eight hundred uh, data sets, UN World Bank, and you see how you compare them. How we we started it doing it during the COVID crisis and say. Which country is doing uh, the, how you compare the data sets? And then uh, Jovan Igic came with interesting uh, ranking of the countries and saying uh, in the red colors are deviations. If countries are no points uh, among top 10, then you suddenly see the countries uh, 68 on some points, on 100. And then you, you start asking, what is the reason? Sometimes it's a trivial reason, sometimes 
it trigger you to do research. But Jovan, you may. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, so you just compare uh, countries uh, on the various uh, features uh, we collecting. So you can uh, see how certain countries are doing in 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 certain fields. Uh, are they outliers? Uh, 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 by some standard, we use uh, different uh, auto detection methods. So you can see uh, uh, red red uh, fields are actually the fields on which uh, someone should pay attention to and 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 ask maybe what's happening by re on this position. So uh, uh, can I just uh, finish with the uh, with the debt problems uh, uh, regarding organizational. Uh, retrieving information. So uh, uh, one way is to uh, transform that information into it, uh, the unstructured data into some different types, maybe vector database or or uh, knowledge graph or uh, inverted index matrices. Uh, but you have to transform them and then to be able to retrieve uh, specific specific information. And then when you retrieve information, you uh, step into the other universe of problems. Uh, how? What? What do you do with that information? What kind of algorithms can help you uh, generate some knowledge from that information? Generate some text, and how to control that text generation? So uh, um, this is uh, what are we gonna try to experiment here uh, at the depot? We are trying to explore all these uh, approaches and combine them. So we use both. Uh, uh, vector databases, uh, knowledge graphs databases, and uh, inverted index matrices, and try to uh, end experts as a as a fourth uh, leg, and try to uh, to um, find the best way how to retrieve uh, valid information. Intelligence. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Johan. One one when you were talking, uh, it reminds me what two of you mentioned, which is sometimes useful when you don't have a. Um, a lot of funding and you are not academic institution that you are then needs driven. We have to develop all of these tools for practical uh, needs to explain to diplomats what does it mean pattern recognition on the example of flags. That's that's basically, this is a simple explanation or to do with these data sets or to do with speed generator. Therefore, that's an interesting, which I, for a long time I thought, why we don't have this huge funding of AI companies or uh, universities, but with hindsight, without donors in the room uh, uh, quoting me a lot, with hindsight, that could be sometimes advantage. Life is paradoxical, you know, disadvantage turning into advantage and the other ways around, but that needs driven approach always give you sort of reality check. This can be done. This is the, this is the, there will be a few other applications, including the latest one on the X-ray of international organization in Geneva, analysis of all official documents of all international organization for digital issues. We are preparing new issue of the Geneva Digital Atlas, and they will be scanning how they, how a World Health Organization works with the ITU with trade through the analysis of documents. Therefore, not what I think, but let's see in the documents what it is and what Samir you said we will probably can can uh, uh, compare notes and work uh, work together on it because you are doing also a lot on the document analysis. Okay, uh, cut. Uh, uh, let's now move to the to the uh, interaction with the, first with online audience and then you here in the room. What are the questions, cut or comments? So as, as I said earlier, we had a really really interesting and lively discussion um, in the chat. I'm going to go in reverse chronological order. So one of the recent points that came up uh, is really interesting from Ginger Park. So a common distinction when we talk about AI is between augmentation and uh, automation. But Ginger brought in a term that is uh, much older from 1956, and the term is intelligence amplification, which comes from this whole discussion on, on cybernetics. And intelligence amplification is perhaps a very useful term when we talk about AI in diplomacy and mediation, and perhaps a less, less threat, a threatening term. Uh, we then had quite a, quite a useful conversation in terms of the social contract of, uh, of uh, about AI. So who develops the applications, who owns the applications, who owns the data. There were suggestions that it should really be the UN that develops such applications, but then also questions about how other countries and regional organizations could get access to them and questions about uh, basically who owns the data, kind of mirroring uh, a lot of the points that we raised in the beginning of uh, our conversation. 
Uh, one last point I want to bring into this is the question of um, trust in diplomacy and mediation and basically that we cannot get rid of, of personal interactions. And I'm just going to read this very quickly. Um, former U.S. Senator George Michael said that his success in Northern Ireland was the fact that no matter how little progress might have been made, it was his dedication to flying to Ireland each week that built trust. So basically building trust through personal interaction, but also perhaps in, in this uh, day and age emphasis on personal face-to-face -face interactions, flying to Ireland each week. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Um, really interesting comments that I would like to, I think would be really interesting to hear reflections from the panel on. Uh, would you like to take the second hat that you're wearing now instead, instead of, in addition to online moderator, and uh, see what are the, what are your comments on, the, on these questions? Um, well, in, in terms of um, trust and personal interaction, I think also basically mirroring what, what Andreas said in, in his intervention, that not only do diplomats and mediators, mediators feel like that uh, diplomacy and mediation is more of an art than a science, and that the human human aspect uh, should take precedent, that definitely needs to be emphasized. And I think technology is not here to replace that in, in any way, shape, or form, and it would be dangerous to assume so. And I think building what Andrea said would also be dangerous to assume that we can somehow calculate peace or, or measure peace or calculate an ideal negotiation um, outcome. The second point regarding uh, who owns the data and kind of the UN as, as the place to develop these tools. I think that's crucial, especially if you think of things like the digital divide and the kind of inequality between countries when it com comes to digital tools. So as we enter this era of artificial intelligence, many observers have said that this kind of inequality is just going to increase. So it's a, it's a huge question. If you look at uh, traditional diplomacy, if some foreign ministries have access to these tools for forecasting, for preparing diplomats for negotiation using artificial intelligence tools. This very well, very likely increases uh, inequalities between countries. And one place where this could be mitigated is of course the United Nations. Um, so yeah, that would be my Thank emphasis. You. And I think that's also a point you make uh, a lot, Johan. Thank you. We'll, we'll uh, get back to the, our uh, colleagues from UNICC. Many questions are related to the UN and them. But first, let's say with, uh, um, with Anders. Anders, uh, we have two examples from history. Vienna Congress, 1980, 1840, 1840, 1850. A lot of fun. The Austrian uh, uh, um, uh, paid a lot for the for entertainment in Vienna. And they made a reasonable good deal, which hold the global peace for almost 100 years. You have fast forward, you have a post First World War, Versailles, Paris negotiations, scientists are coming, statisticians, they're measuring everything, they're measuring reparation, and then we have war only 20, well, 20 years later, even an unstable period. Uh, anything on that uh, lesson from, uh, from two important negotiations in history, and uh, their impact on uh, our wisdom with using of science numbering and calculation, what, what Kat mentioned. Quick reflection from you, and then we are moving to the other comments uh, here in the panel and to our audience here. Over to you, Anders. Great examples, uh, uh, Jovan, really. Um, I think what, you know, what they make really, really clear is that we shouldn't fetishize technology. I think there is, you know, and science for that matter. Uh, it might not necessarily be the right calculations that 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 AI or AI supported uh, science are, is doing, or it could be the after party or a party or uh, you know other other means of uh, other human means and social political means of achieving a peace agreement. Um, you know, I think uh, you know the peace of Westphalia is also very much built around you know a culture of norms that have emerged after. Uh, so it's not only the peace agreement that really makes it or made it uh, stick for for a long time. And I think this is why it's really 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 important to 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 reflect also on the role of 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 of, of politics and, and and society and and, and culture. Um, in all that, I'd like to just, if I may, just make a very short insertion on the question of machine autonomy, whether, whether we should, should call it augmented or artificial intelligence. I think these are important uh, discussions, but I think what what's what's really key for us is to get to a sense that we understand we you know peace is made in socio technical systems where machines do have increasing 
autonomy. They play increasingly autonomous roles here and there. And one term that I think helps me uh, in my studies and maybe also helpful for others is to think about distributed agency. So, you know, if you think about a peace agreement being reached, there's, you know, lots of agents that are involved in that, lots of factors that influence that, and machines and artificial intelligence being increasingly one. Now, I think what's important is to get a sense of what that agency is that AI has and what impact it has on the process. And, and as very briefly, just to say, so when I talk to AI scientists or, or computer scientists about you know, how they would, for instance, model uh, you know, arguments, narratives, opinions, et cetera, in written text, obviously the models that are possible to do might be different from my sense of what a narrative or an argument is, right? So I think it's very important to also get a sense of this kind of subtle power that, that these models might have in, in shaping our view on the world and therefore our capability to make peace. Um, and I think that's worthwhile uh, having having more 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 discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andres. Two, two points. We are getting back to our panel with two key questions. To Samir Marco, you can decide the question, who owns the data? What is the role of the UN? And the question of inequality, which is emerging. Can we expect some sort of a AI, uh, AI divides, big divides, and uh, that reflection then. And I'm inviting our audience to think about question and comments. We have about 15 minutes, 20 minutes for discussion. I'm sure they will be excellent questions. I'll try and uh, tackle them and then Marco jump in with any additional thoughts. So uh, the question about who owns the data, uh, I, I, I'm biased, I sit in the UN. So I think there are certain kinds of data that should stay with the UN uh, just because of the, fact that it's a, to me for the very first time we created an entity like the UN which spans the globe all 193 countries are member states uh, and it has accorded certain privileges and immunities to the UN so what that means is if we hold certain data nobody has access to it or everybody has access to it depending on how you look at it so it's not privy to just one country or to one region so for that reason alone I think uh, especially if this data is being used in means uh, in ways where you are saying I will train my AI with this, or I'll derive some intelligence from this. Uh, it needs to belong to the world. And I can't think of any other uh, safe holder better than the UN. But clearly, I speak with a bias. <laughs> I am in the UN. Uh, positive bias. <clears throat> it's positive bias. It's positive bias. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so yes, so, so data, I think UN could be a great repository for holding that data. Uh, along with that, to me, is uh, who, holds, who holds the IP or the intelligence, right? Uh, I think that was part two, if I'm understanding. Yeah. And then that uh, becomes very tricky. Uh, so in some of the more uh, cutting edge cases where we've applied this, uh, it is contentious. Uh, the commercial companies clearly believe part of it is their IP. And where do you draw the line to say, this was your baseline tech, this is what we have built on top of it. So this becomes the UN's IP is very important because Otherwise, if, uh, and, and I think you kind of touched upon that in your earlier observations, John, that uh, the public-private partnerships, we need to make them stronger. And as a, a, a public entity, we need to realize we are actually equal participants and equal contributors in this. So we have a say. We should not just take what is given to us and appreciate it, saying you, the private sector, is giving me X for free or X at a certain discount. Thank you very much. We are also contributing into that pot. Uh, so we need to draw the lines, in my opinion, a little bit better uh, so that the ownership is more in the public goods space. Uh, otherwise, this digital uh, divide will absolutely widen over time. And, and uh, you already see this acceleration, which we saw in the pandemic, where the large tech giants just grew massively, right? You can see that acceleration happening, and that will continue with, with the IP and the ownership that they have. Uh, it has massive, in my opinion, massive implications. So we need to make sure the IP is retained in some kind of a public-private collective uh, so that uh, other countries can benefit from it too, uh, who may not be as, uh, as far along. Uh, I, I think the SG's uh, panel, which you were uh, chairing uh, on in, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Digital Cooperation, that was one of the key highlights that you flagged there is how do you bridge this digital divide? And I think it's one of the new problems that the UN needs to have a point of view on, like we did with everything else in the past, including trade, including human rights, including health, including what have you. This is one of the new frontiers where we need to have a stance. 
to say uh, this is how we bridge the digital di divide and to bridge it, this is how we build a commons collective where all of this IP sits in a way that everybody can tap into it, everybody can benefit from it. I know I'm speaking a bit in hypotheticals, but I, I'm passionate about it. I think that is essential to break the digital divide. Otherwise, I'm bad at forecasting. 20 years, 50 years from now, you'll have large corporates who decide where the world is going and who the rest of the world will not have much of say about it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sammy. Marco will comment, but uh, you, Sammy, you inspired me on discussions that we had about during the COVID time. When we asked the simple question, we two were together at one panel. When you go to the public meetings at the UN, you go to the UN premises. Privileges, you have privileges and immunities. When you go to parliament, you go to the parliament building. But during COVID time, we were going to the, to the corporate uh, platforms, whether it is Zoom or Microsoft Teams, which was a great service. It provided the uh, continuity and it was excellent. But there was a question, both symbolical and practical. Uh, is there a need that as UN has its own uh, premises here in Geneva or in New York or in Vienna, should we have some premises online? That's that's we had we initiated that discussion, but this is also a point that we will reflect more, even on symbolic level. Do you go to the place where you enter? Do you do you that companies can contribute, uh, like countries are contributing a stature here or the room in the New York from Denmark? Excellent, uh, excellent design. But it is a major issue, especially developing countries are concerned about it. And I've been hearing during my work at the UN panel, that was a major concern that in addition to functional approach, let's do, let's uh, don't, we don't care if the cat is white or black, what Deng Xiaoping said, it's important that it can't catch mice. But then people said, wait, 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 the color of cat may matter, especially in the long-term uh, uh, sort of capturing what Samir indicated. I'm putting it in blunt, blunt terms, but it is an interesting dilemma. Mark, what is your, Take on, uh, take on it and then we move to the room for your comments. Yes, no, it is an extremely important topic. Just to add maybe a couple of, of, of uh, quick things. One is that, uh, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to innovation and new technology, there is the occasional innovator that may be outside of the context, uh, outside of big companies uh, in less fortunate, uh, you know, countries, but that is normally maybe just at the beginning and it could be few individuals, the outlier, but it really you need the, uh, a digital divide is there, it's very real. And the, these are more the exceptions, you know, even in uh, during a uh, time of innovation. So it, it is very real. And I think that the member states have very important role to play. Um, and I'm saying that because uh, uh, clearly, there are member states uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, there is a support for the own economy and the companies, and there is a support to the UN, and maybe different people have different support. So it's uh, it's an important element at one point, uh, the, you know, uh, that there should be a right view of the greater good and, uh, and making the right decision, including for the ownership of data. Today, there are uh, a lot of consortia uh, around the AI ethics that are driven by commercial companies. So they're, they're coming up with their own uh, rules of conduct, which, which is good. It's, it's, it's very useful thinking, and it's a contributor to the discussion. Uh, but clearly, it should, be, it should be really institutional. It should be an institutional decision. It should be a, a broader uh, discussion and agreement on what those principles are. There are signs. There is the UNESCO you know, principles. There is the EU proposals. So there are signs that institutions are waking up uh, uh, to that, but I think it needs to happen sooner rather than later, because these, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, commercial companies clearly are working with data, and uh, the work today is happening without that construct of clarity on where the ownership lies. Therefore, it's uh, by default, you know, it's it's owned by by them. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Johan will uh, will uh, update you us at the end with uh, this knowledge graph that we we we, we develop. We are now going for about ten minutes uh, to the room. Uh, any comment, question? Please, uh, could you introduce just yourself quickly? Yeah, my name is Mara Gomez. I'm from Costa Rica. I work at the embassy or embassy in Rome. Okay, nice to see you. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is related to the bias. Uh, with the information that fits the narratives that exist around the conflict, and that it is hard to, to see what is not discussed or what is discussed at the microphone, and the 
interest behind the positions that the parties are bringing to the negotiation table or uh, mediation table. I was wondering if it wouldn't be more interesting to start with the other part of mediation and peace, that is peacekeeping. Because I have heard a lot from the frustration of mediators and the communities that are part of, of, of peacekeeping about the follow-up, the monitoring, the notification, and the reparation processes. So maybe AI could help even more with this second part of peacekeeping, I mean, not starting with peacekeeping. And the second one is, Thank you. Do you think that the violence for peace or that could be uh, understood to be in peace could be taken and transformed to, to start conflict? Um, could you repeat? If you are learning about the violence that peace ah. built in us, can it be transformed by somebody to initiate a war? Okay. That's that's a real philosophical one. Let's uh, let's uh, let's. I'm sure that uh, that uh, Samir and uh, Marco and Johan will. We have question on this side. The third question over there and the uh, fourth, fifth. My God, uh, that's you really. Want, it you seems that we you managed that you didn't fall asleep during this session, you know. <laughs> so, and Boris stayed till the end of the session, which is not typical, you know. All pattern shows that he lives in the third, fourth of the session. You know? Uh, Johan, sorry to interrupt, um, from online, you some see? participants have a hard time. No, no, we, we have now microphone. The first <coughs> question was on the peacekeeping, uh, on the use of patterns and data. The, in the answer, you will repeat the question, but now we have microphone. Could you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Pablo Gonzalez. I'm part of the immersion program in Jesna. And I like it, Jovan, your suggestion of having one seat for young people. But what about having another one for old people that uh, are not knowledgeable on uh, technology? And that for me represents really the digital impact we are discussing here. It's I can see it there. I'm talking about, I'm thinking about the silent, silent part of the population that is not technologically aware or it doesn't use Twitter. Uh, I reflect on what Samir says about uh, evaluating the results of a conference based on just the Twitter. Uh, are we not uh, putting too much attention, too much bias on developing on developed countries that use Twitter, and uh, even in within developed countries on young people instead of having uh, you know the feedback of a broader part of the population and a broader part of the world. Thank you. Excellent questions. Uh, older people uh, bias uh, in the meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, I forgot, there were two hands uh, there. Yeah. You are, is you recording the questions or <laughs> sort of? <laughs> it's getting really well. We have. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, my name is Suyesh. I work as uh, the program officer of India Science Policy Fellowship Program. So my question is about the possible uh, malicious use of AI in diplomatic practice. Like you can create uh, fake documents, fake videos, fake speeches, and so on. And many other, uh, uh, well, the possibilities with AI, many other uh, you know, negative uses are possible. So given those things, is it uh, required or necessary, if not now, maybe in future, having some kind of rules and regulations for AI in diplomatic practice? Thank you, uh, the rules. Uh very good question, malicious use. Kat, you can hear us now? Sort it's, of. it's still a bit challenging. So just a quick repetition of the question would be good. No, we are going to repeat the questions when they will be answered, just to do economy of time, because we have a few minutes more. Please, yes. uh, shout a bit. Yes, <laughs> uh, I will shout. My name is Ahmed Sleiman. I work as an advisor for the GCC delegation in Geneva. Uh, maybe my question is more to Mr. Samir over there uh, regarding the use of, uh, of AI in diplomatic uh, practice. Uh, we spoke of real-time insights, for example, information that is provided in uh, real time to negotiators. We also spoke about information or technology being provided by commercial providers. And uh, with that, uh, as Marco mentioned, uh, there's a high risk that uh, this information might be wrong or uh, in any case uh, might uh, throw this negotiation or take it sideways. So how would the UN, uh, uh, what approach would the UN use to mitigate the risks, generate trust, 
and convince the delegates or the diplomats at the negotiation that this is a software or a technology we're using from a commercial uh, provider uh, that you can trust and that we can build on to uh, to proceed with the uh, with the talks. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, one more hand over there, and then we are moving on the on the other side. We we'll have to be. Um, uh, my name is Vid Nukala. I'm a senior community engagement officer with uh, EMBO based in Germany. Um, so I was just looking at a news item from maybe about 10 days ago, uh, which says NATO allies have uh, created this new uh, defense innovation accelerator for the North Atlantic or Diana. And one of the key uh, areas is AI and quantum computing, among others. Uh, so we just talked about digital divides. I wanted to understand how does that reconcile with uh, multilateralism. Hmm. Thank you. Excellent question. We have a, a, a question over there. Hi, thank you. Melania uh, from Costa Rica as well, but a scientist, not a diplomat. Uh, first of all, uh, good luck answering all these questions. <laughs> um, secondly, my question is to Samir, and it's complementary to what Pablo was asking about uh, reading the perceptions of the public uh, from Twitter or news and um, passing that through AI. Uh, in my experience, at least, um, I see that the um, impressions on those social media platforms generally tend to be the most extreme, the most angry, the most toxic. So if AI was sitting on that panel in that empty chair, would it be reading us collectively as we are, or would it have a really dramatic, extreme perception of who we are as a collective? Thank you. Thank you. Should we, should we break the mirror or accept uh, what we see in the mirror? Yes. Okay. The, in a, in a, my culture, breaking a mirror brings bad luck. I don't know about uh, about other other cultures. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. We have uh, another pattern is in Diplo. Usually, I'm uh, well known for bad time management, but now I'm sure the panelists will help me to to uh, to challenge this pattern uh, because we have also a few more minutes for Jovan to show the, the knowledge graph from today's session. Peacekeeping uh, from uh, first question from Costa Rica, the question of the using the patterns, uh, chairs for the older bias, malicious use, real-time insights and bias, Diana AI for NATO versus multilateralism, reading public perception and uh, what we'll do with empty chair, at least one. Future generation we will basically be tolerant because we won't be around, but uh, AI would be more difficult. Thank you, I'll try my best. <coughs> so uh, the first uh, set of questions around the bias uh, uh, from the internet, sorry, and, and this was around Twitter, I think. Is, was that your point? No, sorry. Oh, peacekeeping. peacekeeping, yes. Uh, uh, yes, uh, reparations, monitoring, peacekeeping. I, I think you're right. That's a great area to start from. Uh, I think we support the entire UN system. And I can tell you that uh, the UN system is a reflection of the world that created it. So the UN is not homogenous. We don't, we are not consistent in what we do, how we do things, what technology we use. Uh, so each organization, each entity is choosing tech for themselves. Uh, in lots of cases, we come into the picture, we assist them, we support them at, at UNICC, but there is no standardization. So I, I'm pretty certain uh, the secretariat, which drives the whole uh, agenda around peacekeeping and uh, monitoring and things like that, they are exploring use cases as well. Uh, I'm not privy to them, but absolutely that's an area to explore. And you're right, I think that may be an easier area to start tackling things from uh, and then build from there. Uh, and then, sorry, the second point was patterns and I wrote something which made sense then now. <laughs> you are collecting data? Yes. Oh yes, to, to, yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. I think uh, in the middle of the pandemic, we were having these discussions uh, and I was involved in meetings with diplomats and they said the same thing. They, there was one particular country where they said we wanted to use the pandemic to go digital. So what we did, did is we started publishing all of our official uh, decisions, documents online immediately to say, see where we can go digital, we can share it with the public. And within half an hour, all the documents were forged, 
different version of it, which looked real, was published, which changed the stance, changed the point of view, and that started a whole media outburst. So they said it's not just good enough to be agile and be digital and start publishing. What you have to be prepared for this onslaught of of uh, fake news or whatever you want to call it, which will start to distort the conversation, distort the decisions you're making. So it's very real, and this is just simple documents, but. If you start using AI, you, you could really do harm. And back to Katharina's point, you can use AI for good or bad. Unfortunately, there are always actors out there who are trying to distort and, and, and it's a means to an end, whatever the ends might be. Uh, and I'm kind of tying into the point that was raised about NATO, for example. We so have a NATO, we have uh, older people and the current <coughs> bias, we have malicious yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll use. Yeah, please. So, but NATO, uh, this is, uh, I'm an army brat. My dad was in the army. But I, I feel strongly, we as a civil, whatever, human beings, we spend way too much money on building weapons uh, and, and rolling out the latest cutting edge tech. And right, so if NATO is using AI, there's a reason for it, of course, uh, but not even one hundredth of that goes towards peacekeeping and mediation and reparations and the spaces where we could actually do some real good, right? And so. Yeah, uh, I think we could be doing a lot more, but we unfortunately don't. As, as a race, we, we tend to focus on, uh, uh, with some of the conflicts that are happening now and countries are donating billions, but those billions are for weapons. Uh, and when it comes time for reparations, all of a sudden the purses will be much tighter, unfortunately. And that's just who we are as a human race. Uh, so uh, <laughs> silent population, absolutely. And then I want to clarify, there were two points uh, raised on Twitter. Uh, Twitter I use as shorthand for looking at social media and we looked at social media just FYI during some of these meetings just to understand what's the public sentiment. It did not drive any of the decision making at the meeting itself. What we did do is for the actual participants who are hybrid, so you had participants from uh, hundreds of locations around the world who were participating, we were doing real-time sentiment analysis of the actual live participants, not what was what the average population, which was obviously one very biased towards uh, certain parts of the world, more tech savvy, younger, uh, and also more extreme in their opinions. That was let's monitor that. But this was what was the, the real meat of the real participants of what was driving the conversation. So just to clarify, and then that's an open uh, can of worms to say: Should you look there, look under that cover, or just leave it to say this is? more festering worms than anything else and let it be. Uh, not sure I have <laughs> a good answer there. Uh, malicious use of AI and fake documents, I think I touched upon, that's a real issue. Uh, uh, tech by commercial providers, I think somebody brought that up. Long term, I think uh, we will need those public goods, public digital goods is my opinion. And I may, I'm not correct half the time, Marco works for me, he knows. I'm wrong, and my wife will tell you I'm wrong five times a day at least. So <clears throat> who knows, but I think we need, we, we genuinely, the world will need uh, uh, public digital goods because that's the only way for us to change the equation somehow, somewhere. It could very well be the commercial entities that are willing to make uh, uh, a public version, a public branch, if you will, of their code base that is designed for use by uh, the likes of the UN and the NGOs and so on. We need that. Uh, and I think maybe I'm done with most, most of the points. Marco, you agree with everything that your, your boss said, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Please, if you have... Uh, there was one on mal malicious use. I think you asked if there is a need for convention of treaty. Yes, yes. That yes. maybe you can... Uh, <laughs> yes. on, uh, no, that. that was... Yes, absolutely. That's, that's a very interesting one. And, and I think that should be... That, that should absolutely be objective. Um, in, in the sense, as I was referring before, right now we have the, this uh, ethics, uh, uh, you know, papers and agreement that are run by commercial providers. So we should really be, be going be going beyond that. And again, I refer back to the uh, you know your regulation, which is specific. It's looking at the use of uh, regulating the AI, particularly the high risk AI, and uh, the high risk uh, essentially in, in the concept will have to be augmented, meaning there will be always a human, uh, it's not finished the, the, the law that, uh, or the, 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 the rules that they are working on, but the idea is that this high risk will always be augmented. The risk will be defined based, based on the impact it will have on the stakeholders, in the people that uh, will be affected by the, the, the effects of this AI. 
uh, there are other elements, but that's the key element. And uh, if the risk is there are different level of risk, there will be even an acceptable risk. Certain AI will be forbidden by the law. So simply you can't run that AI. You can't run deep fakes, you can't run. So that's outlawed, for instance. Uh, certain types that will be dangerous. I guess uh, into that realm will start to be the, the kind of autonomous weapon. Some of them, I'm not sure if they will be within the acceptable, within some of them, within the acceptable, but always with human in control. So it will be augmented rather than, you know, rather than fully, fully autonomous. So that's in the works. Again, EU is going forward. Um, I think we need more wider. So we need the, you know, UN, and there is, there is uh, uh, I think the Secretary General in this roadmap, digital roadmap, you mentioned explicitly, there is a requirement for uh, you know for discussion and decisions around AI specifically, and uh, you know rules, accepted rules by everyone around AI. So that's uh, you know that, that's what is absolutely needed. I don't think there is any way around it, and it's needed sooner rather than later. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Andreas and Katerina, people from JESDA are standing uh, in this position uh, since I'm going over the time for a few minutes. The body language is clear. Jovan, uh, finish it as soon as possible. <laughs> Therefore, if you want to uh, save me and not to be declared persona non grata at JESDA, please, uh, please, uh, if you don't mind, we'll, uh, we'll pass the, your uh, comments or have them uh, uh, extremely uh, quick. Uh, and then we move just for last few minutes Minutes. I'm sorry, Jovan, that we'll squeeze your presentation of knowledge graph in a few minutes. Fine with you, Kat and Andreas, that we follow up uh, via email for any question from online audience. Thank you for saving me. Jovan, uh, what, uh, what is the knowledge from today's session? Okay, so we, we created this knowledge graph. Uh, my colleague Anya will, will uh, uh, share the screen and explain how it works. Uh, you shouldn't expect anything perfect, but it's... Uh, interesting to see what can be extracted, what kind of knowledge can be extracted in almost real time uh, from, from uh, some modest uh, computer usage. So uh, Anya, please, if you can uh, explain what, what I was seeing. Just here. to explain the first 40 minutes of our session. Yes, today. the first 40 You will minutes. have after the session for the full session knowledge graph. Anya, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we created a knowledge graph, and before creation of this graph, we had to extract to extract name entities, and we done that uh, by using uh, transformers. Uh, we used several technologies like Spacey, Hagenface, Neo4j, and Highstack, and we tried to extract the name entities. After that, uh, we added to our pipeline a uh, co-reference part, which helped us to create those uh, links and afterwards to create triplets and to create our knowledge graph. So uh, as uh, Jovan already mentioned, it can be perfect, but I think that it uh, has done quite nice job. So we can uh, see here all our panelists uh, we can see some of the technologies that you haven't mentioned that we are using and some external graphs that we are using for our queries like uh, Battle.net, DBpedia, uh, I saw it, yeah, it's here, Knowledge Graph, Cat uh, Hone, uh, as well as uh, some of the uh, topics that are mentioned like AI, cybersecurity, our data lab, and so. And uh, here is as well a Diplo node. And the thing that we wanted to do to enrich our knowledge graph is if some of those actors' names, uh, topics exist on uh, Wikipedia, uh, uh, to be precise, Wikidata, we added Q codes. So uh, there are some uh, good uh, uh, findings and some that not are that good. So for instance, for AI, I can just now... Uh, you can just enlarge slightly, Anya, because uh, I don't know if it is my eyesight, but I trust you what you're telling us, but uh, it would be good to, to, to have a chance to read. <laughs> okay, now it's much better, yes, okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, the thing was, 
I cannot now find it, uh, but yeah. Uh, so the thing was that we tried to enrich our graph with uh, uh, Q codes, and uh, the thing was that it can be perfect because it's done, done automatically. So we uh, do fuzzy search of the topic or, or the words of the node. So for instance, I can just now stop sharing to share another screen, I'm sorry. Uh, here uh, for the, I'm not sure if you're seeing, yeah, uh, for the data, for instance, it found a good node. Uh, can you see this uh, wiki data? No, no, we're still seeing uh, knowledge it's the graph. Same. Okay. See, it's the same, it's still a no, 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 knowledge graph. Uh, good. Desktop. Maybe now we can see it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, so for the Q code for the artificial intelligence, it's uh, found a good uh, uh, Wikipedia page, but for the deep organization, uh, it found the uh, American DJ. So that. <laughs> My God, we have to change the name of the organization. <laughs> you see, you put 20 years of career into the brand and then you. <laughs> so, yeah, this is just one part of our graph. <laughs> yeah, and this is just one part of our graph. And here we uh, tried to record it in. Uh, like whole graph and it's huge. So we just wanted to show this is our whole graph and it's, it has uh, 70,000 nodes. So uh, we linked uh, the things that you saw, sorry, uh, here uh, with some topics that people are researching, our actors, our blogs as well. You can see this here is topic. Those are the blogs that we tried to link the uh, parts of our session. So this is one thing that we've done uh, while you were talking. And the other one is here. Uh, here as well, we used uh, transformers and we've done zero shot classifier because we didn't have enough time to do some fine tuning of the models that are pre-trained. Uh, zero shot classifier is trying to classify the sentence that we gave him uh, the best he can because it, it doesn't have any fine tuning. So uh, you can see here that uh, most addressed issues are uh, showed here. It's not perfect and uh, with some fine tuning, it can be better, but I think it's quite good. Uh, word cloud with uh, most frequent words, most frequent known chunks, uh, names and entities as well. And here are prominent verbs with adverbs. So uh, this is the- Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Anya. Uh, what's, uh, that's 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 great, uh, and uh, we we try to decipher the map, but we trust you that it is uh, good and comprehensive. But just to to uh, to to uh, to to add to the Anya's excellent presentation, this is knowledge graph that we uh, gathered in the first forty minutes. We'll have a knowledge graph for the whole session. Then, what is a crucial? This is sort of our pattern of our discussion today, even in this graphical format. This is sort of our ownership, our public good. Then we add it to the Diplo, which is also public good, where you had these 70,000 nodes. Next time when we run uh, policy uh, analysis, uh, trend analysis, uh, course, online course, we just go back to these patterns and say, what are the typical patterns uh, when you discuss AI in, in, in qualities? And then we'll come to what Marco and Samir said about, uh, about inequalities and use of data. So it's very practical use. One, it is codified, but our point is that it should be owned by us here. It should be owned by you. It should be owned by uh, UNICC, by Diplo, by public good. And that's a very important point. And then uh, this is our collective heritage of mankind, which have been uh, caring for the thousands of years. And there is no reason to privatize this on this point. We as a public should put the uh, efforts and we have enough wisdom through good public-private partnership to keep it for the, what is the chair for the future generation over there? And uh, uh, thank you, without, uh, with the risk, uh, uh, I can, Sandro, you, you left it down, the, this pose, uh, therefore I'm sort of semi-persona non grata. Thank you for your tolerance. Thank you for your, uh, your uh, patience. Thank you for our online audience, for Kat, Anders, Anya, for uh, to Samir, Marco, 
Jovan, to all of you for not uh, falling asleep. I was carefully monitoring the room and I didn't uh, see any crisis in the room. Therefore, we managed to do almost impossible to keep all of us awake after good, uh, good lunch. Thank you. Have a nice uh, rest of the day. Thank you.